Thanks everybody for joining. This is Matt Britton from Suzy. And we are going to be um, going through our sixth State of US Consumer Webinar. Uh, for those of you who do not know what Suzy is, Suzy is a real-time market research platform um, that allows brands and businesses of all sizes really to make better, more data-driven decisions uh, through the power of people. Uh, we have an always-on panel of over a million U.S. consumers, which are giving feedback on everything from product designs to pricing to advertising, you name it. Um, and we're really blessed and thrilled to be working with the customers we are. Um, today, we are going to be talking about the impact of instability. Um, I'm going to be leading a presentation for about half an hour, and then we have a special guest, uh, my dear friend, Dahani Jones. For those of you who don't know Dahani, he is not short of opinion and things to say. Um, he's had an incredible life and lots of experiences um, as a prolific entrepreneur and a professional athlete, and really excited to get his take on everything that's going on um, in our very scary world right now. Um, so we are talking about today the impact of instability. Obviously, um, everyone who's watching and listening right now is no stranger to the social unrest and discourse that is going on um, throughout the United States and really around the world. Uh, we are trying to do our part um, at Suzy. Uh, we have been long um, been driving an initiative called Suzy Cares. And one of the initiatives that we're doing is really trying to um, help empower the next generation of minority leaders. Um, and especially in the inner city, we have been executing a program to try to donate laptops. So many companies out there have laptops that are not in use, and we want to put them in the hands um, of inner city youth to really be able to enable them to become the next generation of tech entrepreneurs. Also, through our platform, CrowdTap, which is essentially where our million plus person panel lives, um, the people who participate in CrowdTap are able to earn uh, points, which they can cash in towards things like Amazon gift cards. We've um, added the ability for them to be able to um, instead of retrieve their points for donations to great organizations like the NWACP Legal Defense Fund. Um, and those donations we are um, actually matching as well. So um, we're definitely proud of Susie to do our part to help um, stifle, um, to actually to help, uh, sorry, proliferate uh, much more diversity uh, within the tech world. So today we are going to be going over the results of a study uh, that we have conducted through our own Susie platform. Two studies were conducted from May 27th through June 1st. The first study was conducted uh, with 1,000 participants um, and went from May 27th to 29th. And the second was conducted on June 3rd, 1st, also with 1,000 participants. Um, sample sizes in these studies are directionally representative of U.S. consumers and census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. Uh, really what we're trying to uncover today is the in impact of instability on consumers. We are going through a year unlike any year that any of us have lived in history. And at the end of this year, there's going to be uh, movies and case studies and books written about the life that we have, have gone through. And um, fortunately or unfortunately, depending upon how you see things evolving, we are really only halfway through it right now. We have an election coming up in November. Uh, there is so much instability. And really what I'm trying to bring to everybody today is really um, human understanding and a human voice. Uh, this is not um, CNN or Fox or political commentary. It is not my intention to try to take sides on issues. Um, it's my intention to try to give everybody um, a peer into what consumers are thinking and feeling and what it means for how they're going to act as consumers in the back half. So just to be clear before going into it, this is what uh, this webinar is all about. We have had much discussion internally at Suzy on whether or not we should even conduct this webinar today, given everything that's going on. We feel that we have a responsibility to our customers, to our partners, to use our tool to try to help companies get through this because business must go on right now. Um, there are jobs to be had. There are, there are there's food that need, need to be put on the plates of employees. And we want to make sure that our clients can continue to um, try to thrive and prosper uh, despite all the turmoil that's going on um, in our society right now. Um, I think, you know, when it feels like the world's changing and really right now as fast as you can blink, it's really more important than ever to listen to, listen to your consumer. When you see celebrities, when you see brands, when you see CEOs say or do the wrong thing, 
so much more than not, it's not because they didn't have the right intention. It could be that they're not educated enough. It could be that they aren't talking to consumers and really understanding how their words are going to manifest within others' thoughts and feelings. Um, and in that regard, regardless of how large of a brand you know that you are behind or how large of a business it is that you're running, it's really so imperative uh, now more than ever before that you do speak with consumers. Um, you know, consumers right now really are dictating the future of consumer sentiment. And it's often true that also they don't really even know the future as it stands right now. 70% uh, of Americans right now are, are actually admitting that they underestimated, for example, the length of time that the COVID-19 outbreak would last. Um, when we did our first state of the consumer webinar back in March, and it feels like it might as well be 30 years ago versus um, three months ago. Um, you know, many consumers were thinking that the COVID-19 crisis was going to end by the end of March and we would go back to life as we know it. Uh, we all know that is not the case. However, we are, with regards to the COVID crisis at least, starting to see some signs of things turning around. Um, we are starting to see states around the country either um, in phase one or entering phase two um, of reopening plans. What that means is that restaurants are starting to open up, albeit um, with just seating outdoors. You're starting to see a variety of different services and retailers um, engage in curbside pickup. So, you know, we are starly, starting to slowly creep back to life. Whether we're going to see a whiplash of COVID or not um, really remains to be seen. There's obviously a real chance that that occurs. But the fact that consumers now can actually go out and start to do some small semblance of normal things that they did in the past really gives them optimism and hope but at the same time, as soon as the country was starting to um, somewhat recover um, from COVID-19, you know, we start to see a good amount of civil unrest uh, that was occurring um, here in the United States and really around the world. Um, starting on May 26th, as everybody knows, um, there is a significant amount of, of protests going on in the streets of our major cities about the racial injustices really centered around um, the tragic death of George Floyd. And that has had reverberating impacts on the U.S. consumer, on businesses, and obviously on politics and society as a whole. There no doubt going to be structural shifts coming out of this um, in the corporate world, in the political world, um, to make sure that we have a better version of racial equality than we have in the past. And that is something that I as an individual am fully um, in support of. It's not going to be an easy road to get there. And again, as we go down that path, companies are really going to be um, at odds with how to conduct business as usual. And again, that's really what we're going to try to um, at least start to pave the way for um, all of you to do moving forward. So while we're seeing every state starting to open, at the same time, we've seen protests in nearly every state happen as well. Um, you know, people are outraged, especially younger America. And it's not just um, younger Black America, it's white America. It's all, um, you know, Americans really who care about this issue are coming out in force, holding hands and you know, demanding change, demanding change um, from their local and federal government, demanding change from how their uh, local cities are governed by the police forces, and they are speaking out loud. Um, and one, you know, real big dichotomy we're starting to see, um, although it has slightly reversed today, is the stock market. One question we get asked a lot is, well, if there's so much civil unrest right now, we still have just scratched the surface in terms of recovering from the COVID-19 crisis. Why is the stock market boom? Why was the NASDAQ um, up for the year despite everything that's happened? And, you know, I bring this up because on almost every webinar, we've given you all a stat saying that on days the stock market is higher, people have, you know, a more um, hopeful sentiment about the future of the economy. I think now with the divergence of the COVID-19 crisis um, and the civil unrest that's occurring, I'm not so sure that's the case anymore. But the reality is the big reason for this dichotomy is that the markets are generally a forward looking indicator. And just because right now it's hard to see why the markets um, can be at an all time high. Um, at the same time, people are generally hopeful for the future of the U.S. economy. And I think that's going to play out during uh, our presentation today. 
So really what we want to unpack today is how is all this impacting your consumer? You've all seen the news. You all see what's going on right now um, you know, in our society. What does all of this mean for how consumers are thinking, feeling, and acting? What they're buying, um, what their perceptions are moving forward. Um, so we're really going to explore today two different components of this. First, what are your consumers thinking? And second, what are your consumers actually doing? So we're going to start with what are your consumers thinking? And as always, we're going to go into our segment, um, Ask America, where we're essentially going to allow um, everyone who's on this webinar to tell us something that they're interested in knowing in terms of what consumers are thinking. So what you see right now is four questions. Uh, and what we'd like you to do is vote on which of these four questions you would like us to answer using our Suzy research tool. The first and foremost, has the current situation made you rethink purchases you've already made? Second, how concerned are you for your children's future due to the uncertainty? Third, which brands have made you feel supported right now? And fourth, how long will the state of the world um, impact your purchase and purchase decisions? So again, pick the question that you'd like to see us most answer with our Suzy tool. And at the end of this webinar, um, we will um, answer that for you. And hopefully um, we'll be able to give you guys some a little bit more information um, in terms of how to unpack everything that's going on right now. So uh, moving on. First and foremost, what we want everyone to know is people are consuming media coverage based upon the social unrest and the protests far more than anything we've actually even seen with COVID-19. What you're looking at here is historical uh, Google search volume. And as you can see, they both had a similar baseline in terms of um, how many times consumers were typing the terms COVID-19 and protests in the Google. And what you can see is how protests as a search term shot up to a level dramatically higher, um, over 35% higher than the term COVID-19 ever was. So this just goes to show the dramatic impact um, of, of these protests, of the social unrest is causing on the US consumer where we had a once in a century pandemic occur and the surge volume of that was actually dwarfed by protests. So there's been so much going on in terms of content around how should brands deal with this time of uncertainty. The reality is that there's even a greater tectonic shift going on right now within the consumer that brands need to be really cognizant of given the, the, the social unrest that's occurring right now um, on our streets. Um, I thought this was a really interesting development uh, that um, Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, shared um, on Twitter, where if, uh, and this is something that actually just came out yesterday, if you share an article on Twitter and Twitter knows that you actually haven't clicked on that article, it's actually going to prompt you to make sure that you've read an article um, before you've actually shared it. And I think they are starting to catch on. And this is going to be a theme we're going to talk about a lot today in terms of just misinformation. And no matter what the crisis is, um, we're seeing misinformation creep into our system, creep into our media landscape. Uh, now more than ever with social media. Obviously, before uh, this current crisis and before the pandemic hit, we saw it play out um, really loud and clear in the 2016 elections with misinformation and Russian intervention and things of that nature. And we're really starting to see it play out right now um, with the civil unrest that's going on, where people are sharing articles, maybe based upon the headlines that they're seeing, but they're actually not reading the story. So if you're creating content, I think it's incumbent upon you as a business, as an influencer, as a content creator to make sure that, um, you know, the cover of the book really matches the content of the book, if you will, um, because a lot of people aren't reading articles they are just sharing um, articles, uh, headlines as really as a show of support for their personal brand and what they believe in. But you need to make sure that the content in that article matches the headline. And I just want to say kudos to Twitter for taking this step. Obviously, uh, the social media companies right now uh, really are under tremendous this pressure um, in terms of taking action. And we'll talk about Facebook in a little bit later in this webinar in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the quandary that they're in and how they are, are or maybe not taking the right path uh, towards this. One question brands often ask is, should we stand up? If we are a business and we sell toothpaste or we sell shampoo, um, what right do we have to actually stand up for social issues? And the reality is more than half of consumers are saying right now that they feel that brands should stand up for social issues. Now, it's easier said than done. How do you know if a brand, if you're a brand and you are standing up for these issues, if you're going to be taken seriously 
if you are going to have a misstep, um, if you are really going to alienate your consumers or not. Um, this is what so many uh, brands are asking themselves before um, they're actually standing up and doing something. But just know that more than half of consumers are saying that they believe that you should. In that regard, nearly 40% of consumers have actually seen a brand respond to the current protest movement. Um, and that's obviously taken a variety of different forms. Uh, more often than not, over 60% of the times, uh, they're seeing brands offer community support um, or offer uh, solidarity. But more so, and we're seeing this creep up more and more, is that now we're seeing brands offer uh, resources for their employees or actually financial support. So it's really taking a lot of different forms in terms of how brands are taking a stamp, are speaking up um, against the social injustices that they're seeing play out um, in our society. Uh, but I think that the reason why donations and employee resources maybe have taken longer is that just from a logistical standpoint, it takes longer to pull those things together. But I think you're going to start to see that actually happen more and more. Uh, brand managers are, are obviously trying to figure out um, how to approach this. Brand managers, CEOs, um, et cetera. Is it appropriate? We talked about earlier. Is, is it appropriate for brands to actually speak at all? Who should be delivering the message? I think you'll see some of the examples that we're going to be talking about today. In some instances, it's the CEO of the company taking a stand, stepping up as the spokesperson. In other instances, the brand is actually letting the logo or the brand um, speak for the brand itself. And other companies are letting the consumers be the voice of the brand for them. So that's something that a brand really needs to figure out uh, before they dive in. What actions are, are we going to take? I think there's a notion of talking the talk or walking the walk. And I think consumers now more than ever expecting brands who are going to speak up aren't just going to put out a tweet or, or post something on Instagram that they're actually going to walk the walk and actually do something to enact change. Should we publicize our actions? That's a question that a lot of individuals, um, you know, um, philanthropists, brands are, are really struggle with, you know, often what I've seen, and obviously we have this whole cancel culture going on in social media right now, where it's just on one hand, uh, you know, you have this uh, rush of consumers saying, don't just post something, do something. And then you have people that donate $10,000. And then when they actually post about it, consumers say, well, why do you feel the need to tell everyone that you donated? So in some ways you almost can't win. And ultimately, you need to be true to yourselves as your of your culture and your organization. And no matter what you do, you're always going to have people out there thinking that you didn't do it the right way. But that being said, one question that a lot of big businesses have is, do we publicize our actions or do we just do them behind the scenes um, for that very reasons? So just to kind of peel back the layer of the onion a little bit in terms of what consumers actually do want to see from brands, because I think a lot of brands are struggling with how to act right now. And even those of you who are on the line that have already taken action, I think, you know, you'll, you'll all pretty much agree that just because you may have put something out there or maybe run um, a small initiative to raise money, this is not going to be something that should just come and go over the summer. This is going to be a long term movement by leaders out there to really make sure they're seeing change because you can't undo a um, hundred years of injustices or 200 years of injustices overnight. This is something that you're really going to have to commit to as a business um, on a long-term basis. It's going to last hopefully um, far longer than the COVID crisis in terms of people really standing up and really trying to make um, change with businesses. Uh, nearly half of brands believe that uh, of people believe that brands should be providing some type of financial support for affected employees. So I think that's incredibly important. We've provided financial support for employees, those who are taking initiatives. Um, we are matching their philanthropic donations and finding ways for us to actually support their initiatives. And if, if consumers have been impacted other ways financially, there is an expectation of consumers that a business is taking care um, of its employees. Uh, one example is providing bereavement leave. Uh, leave. So uh, many believe that companies should be uh, supporting black employees right now by providing bereavement leave, leave letting them take time off, um, letting them basically try to heal a little bit from everything that's going on. Um, if you, and you know, I can't imagine um, what a, a black American must be going through right now, but to think that they can go back into work amidst everything that's going on and be fully focused, 
I don't know how you can expect that um, as an employer. So you have to either offer time off or be understanding when people want to take time off um, to actually try to deal with this because there's obviously real mental health implications of things that are going on right now. Other ways companies can provide financial support is something like what Sephora is doing. Um, Sephora uh, made a pledge um, where they're going to commit 15% of their shelf space, um, you know, in their beauty and makeup company um, to uh, businesses that are black owned in their stores to really try to enact change, to really try to give opportunity uh, to black owned businesses um, in the beauty and, and makeup space. And I think that's a that's a great initiative because this is something, a great example of instead of just making a donation, it's really systemic, hopefully within our organization to really be able to enact that lasting long-term change uh, that's going to occur. SoftBank, a real prolific venture capital um, firm is launching a $100 million opportunity growth fund to invest in founders of color. Uh, I believe this is a great initiative because it, being in a tech world right now, you know, for us as a company, Susie is really trying to drive diversity. Sometimes it's, you know, really making sure that there's enough candidates in the field. And I think one thing companies can do is really invest in youth, invest in the future to get more diversity in many sectors and industries that aren't diverse currently. And I think for SoftBank to be able to do this, for SoftBank to be able to um, invest in founders of color moving forward, I think will play dividends for years to come um, and really enact that long-term systemic change. 40% uh, of people believe Branch should be providing emotional support. Um, and, you know, we talk about emotional support and mental health. Uh, this was... Uh, you know, an example of a swimwear startup launching an emotional support hotline um, for individuals that are really struggling with things that are going on. And again, it's really hard to compartmentalize with many consumers, um, you know, why they're feeling the way they're feeling. Is this something that has started uh, be, went during the COVID crisis and now they're being impacted by what's playing out in our society even more so? Uh, for some consumers, it's it really just has to do with the racial issues that are happening. For others, it's really hard for them to compartmentalize and they really need to unpack that. So I think it's great for um, some companies to really be able to dive in and, and, and provide resources on the emotional support side. 40% uh, of people believe brands should publicly support the cause on their social media accounts. So we talk about, you know, should brands publicize these issues or not? Um, many believe they should. We ask consumers which brands are really stepping up the most. And Nike, loud and clear, uh, along with Walmart and Target and Apple, have really been the brands that, in consumers' minds, have most stepped up to the plate um, and really taken a stand. Um, against, um, you know, racial injustice and and really trying to support and, uh, you know, this initiative in a way that isn't just skin deep, so to speak, but is a way that really is going to be um, ingrained in their organization moving forward. So, um, and, you know, many other brands obviously have really taken stands. Nickelodeon uh, went off the air for eight minutes and 46 seconds in support of justice, equality, and human rights. And, you know, that what was interesting to this is that Many overlook the really young kids in, in, in our country, in our society. Nickelodeon obviously has a much younger target, um, and they still believe that they need to speak to their audience and, and be a part of the change. And I thought that was a great statement for them to actually be able to um, you know, say what they believe as an organization. 38% of brands believe uh, that brands should write a statement of support for the cause. Uh, we've talked earlier about who... Um, should be speaking on behalf of a brand? Should it be the brand itself? Um, or should it be maybe an executive within the brand? Um, Target actually released the, you know, a statement through their CEO. And uh, Walmart, as we'll talk about shortly, the Walmart actually CEO made the donation on behalf of himself personally. I think for these large organizations, I do think it's important for the CEO to come out and make a statement. I think a logo talking is is nice to know what a, what a company supports, but nothing really is strong right now as a person, hopefully the CEO personifying what that organization believes and actually uh, making that statement. Uh, other brands have made more of a statement um, on behalf of both their brand itself and by the uh, individual CEO. This is the homepage of Apple, and you can actually see that they blacked out their Apple homepage, but then they also had a message from Tim Cook, their CEO. So almost doing both, both on behalf of the brand and on behalf of the CEO itself. 
Um, other companies have really reacted quickly from a product standpoint uh, to take that stand on initiative. Ben and Jerry is probably being the most notable, um, in my opinion, really starting to right at the beginning, take a stand, put out content, but then actually launching, I don't know how they did this so quickly, an ice cream flavor called uh, Resist to put out there. Uh, so really an artistic uh, interpretation of their feelings as an organization. Uh, ben & Jerry's has long been a brand that really led the way in terms of um, you know, really embedding the culture of their founders into the organization, into how they do business, whether it be environmental issues um, or issues of racial injustice. And this is something that they have supported. And I think it's a great initiative. And the fact that, again, they executed it so fast to me is really fascinating. Um, obviously, people also believe that brands should be writing checks. I mean, people, the, the consumer thinks that brands are wealthy and not all businesses have unlimited money to spend, but a lot of them do. And over a third believe that brands should be putting their money where their mouth is, so to speak. Um, it's interesting because Nike came out with a lot of content at the beginning and there was pushback uh, on Nike for because they have an all white board of directors and people thought that they were just kind of um, really pushing a superficial message and not really supporting it as an organization. But then a couple about a week later, uh, Michael Jordan himself and the Jordan brand, which is Nike's most successful uh, brand extension history, pledged a hundred million dollars towards racial equality. And the, and Nike as a brand has always seemed to step it up uh, with issues, especially ones that impacted the sports world. We showed earlier how um, during um, when Colin Kaepernick, uh, you know, was kneeling during the uh, national anthem, Nike came out and, and made a statement there as well. So, you know, the, the, it's, I'm not surprised that they step, stepped it up there, one that often does. And even though this issue wasn't necessarily just driven around sports as a Colin Kaepernick issue really stemmed from, um, Nike still felt the need and, and, you know, kudos to them for obviously stepping up. And we mentioned CEOs, not just making statements, but uh, putting their money where their mouth is. And, you know, uh, Doug McMillan, the CEO of Walmart pledged a hundred million dollars to address systemic racism, which is not a small amount of money for anybody. Um, and for him to step it up, um, I think really shows that it's not just about their logo or their business. This is a CEO that really believes in these issues to address systemic racism. So, um, you know, good on Walmart in that regard. Facebook has been a company and a brand that really has found themselves really in the center of the bullseye throughout all this. Um, you know, I don't want to make this political at all, so I'm going to try to skate around this, but, um, you know, many believe that Facebook should be taking down uh, certain statements made by the president of the United States and, uh, you know, because they don't believe that support should support the ethics of an organization like Facebook. And Twitter uh, a couple of weeks ago um, started to put fact checking on some of President Trump's tweets. And now Facebook is is really a lot of pressure and, and not just pressure by the media, but they're actually now getting pressure from their own employees. Uh, Facebook employees um, earlier this month staged a virtual walkout in criticism of Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, Facebook is one of the main drivers of reach of um, you know of digital currency um, of e-commerce that exists in the world. It's really Facebook and Google as as a duopoly in that space. And what I've started to see, at least on Twitter, over the last couple of days, is many CEOs starting to question if they're going to advertise um, on Facebook if they should continue with these policies. Uh, you know, obviously Facebook was really at the center of a lot of the uh, disinformation that was happening or misinformation during the 2016 election how Facebook is going to respond over the next six months is going to be fascinating to me in terms of what it means for the future of this company and how Gen Z and the next generation of consumers really supports them. What's fascinating to me is that Gen Z is, is flocking right now towards TikTok, which is a company that's a Chinese based company. Um, so you have the next generation really gravitating towards a Chinese based company, really, um, instead of, you know, the millennials who are really mostly on Instagram um, and Snapchat. So, It'll be interesting to see how that plays out for sure. I'm uh, going to shift gears a little bit to what consumers are doing, uh, aside from what uh, they're feeling. And we're going to go into our next uh, Ask America poll right now. This is the last one we have of today, which is, again, giving you the opportunity to pick the question that you want us to ask our panel, which will give you the results at the end. And the four questions here that you can choose from is, first and foremost, 
Um, have you stopped, and this is what you want to ask us to ask consumers, have you stopped purchasing from any brands that you didn't like how they handled the movement? Two, have you purchased from any brand you haven't before because of how they have handled the movement? Three, have you made an impulse purchase in the past two weeks? And four, how important is a brand's actions in your purchase decision? Does it matter in terms of you purchasing? So you could feel free to um, you know, fill out the question that you'd like to see most answered. And we will move on um, in terms of what consumers are doing right now. So uh, one question we were asked a lot leading up to this webinar is, are the protests specifically impacting overall purchase behavior by consumers? And you know, basically half are saying it has. It's impacted their overall purchase behavior. Now, in a lot of cities, you know, you're seeing uh, retailers that may have been open by now boarded up because there was looting that happened in cities and, and it has delayed the opening of many physical retailers. Um, at the same time, what we're hearing from consumers is it's just kind of poured into the uncertainty uh, in terms of what this means for the economy uh, moving forward. And because of it, you know, again, half of consumers believe it has impacted their purchase behavior. Nearly half of consumers are looking, however, to purchase from more black owned businesses as a result of this movement. So we talked about what Sephora was doing to really put at least 15% of their shelf space dedicated to black owned businesses in the beauty space. Uh, it goes far beyond that industry. You know, what we're hearing from consumers from nearly half of consumers is that, and I would definitely put myself in this bucket, looking to purchase from more black owned businesses result in the movement, giving uh, black entrepreneurs more of an opportunity by seeking them out, not just through happenstance, but making sure that you are supporting black owned businesses. And I think that's, um, you know, a really tremendous uh, sign that consumers really do care. So for brands, really, it, you know, now, and we've talked about this, now's the time to really think about what you stand for now in the future, because consumers don't want, uh, you know, brands to stay silent on this issue. Uh, you know, 65% of consumers saying they're more likely to support a brand that cares about the same social issues as they do. So it matters. It's This is not just uh, a flash in the pan thing. Your brand now needs to be personified. I've long said that brands are people, people are brands. Well, the personification of your brand and the things it stands for, I think now more than ever, will be impacting your bottom line. So putting aside doing the right thing, this is really becoming something that's incredibly important um, you know, for consumers when they look at what brands are gonna patronize. Um, consumers are paying more attention to uh, over half of consumers admitting that they're looking more closely at what brands are saying uh, before purchasing those brands. So they are going to be digging. They are going to be looking um, in your social feeds to see what you support uh, before they decide if you, they're going to want to purchase your product or not. Um, and this is disproportionately the case with younger consumers. Uh, younger consumers are over three times more likely um, to suggest that their purchase that, that that this movement is going to change your purchase behaviors in the future. So you know if you're tar and this is from a woman's word daily um, study, but you know again if you are focused on younger consumers, it's even more important that you are taking a stand um, on these issues and you're pushing, uh, you know, your beliefs out there because consumers are going to be um, watching and they are going to be making sure that the brands that they purchase are representative of how they feel and what they stand for as individuals. So we are, believe it or not, about to head into the summer. When we started to quarantine, it was, we were still in the winter heading into the spring. And here we are heading into the summer and me still being with everybody here virtually. So what does all this mean moving forward? Uh, how are consumers thinking about their summer and what they're going to be spending and what they're going to be doing um, moving ahead? Well, um, if you look at consumer confidence, first and foremost, and this is the consumer confidence index that really does drive um, you know, some stock market decisions, you see the massive drop off that happened uh, with the coronavirus. Uh, we were at basically an all time high um, or a high that wasn't reached since the year 2000 um, when we had the dot com boom. And, you know, one thing that points out to me loud and clear is that the consumer confidence that happened, um, the drop off that happened in 2008, early 2009 with the housing crisis from a confidence standpoint was way more severe than than COVID-19 was. You could look at the, the consumer confidence was down in the 25 uh, point level where, you know, although it did drop off dramatically with the COVID crisis, um, it still leveled off at about um, an 86. So I think many consumers 
believed and still do believe that the U.S. economy will have a fairly quick uh, rebound from this. Um, and this just has an overlay in terms of how they feel about the present situation versus expectations for the future. And expectations for the future were largely unmoved uh, through this crisis. So I think a lot of consumers, while their present situation um, sentiment may have dropped off a lot, they always kind of had an even keel for the most part. And I think that's ultimately what we're seeing uh, play out in the stock markets. Uh, in terms of how consumers think things are going to play out, many consumers now believe that the pandemic is going to last um, another three months. So many consumers are hopeful or do believe that the pandemic will start to take a different shape, uh, slightly less serious shape in September. We don't know if that'll be the case. We could have uh, a second wave of infections with COVID. We could have continued civil unrest happening into the fall, which could obviously impact the markets and impact uh, people's ability to do the things that they normally do. But nearly three quarters believe that this pandemic will last uh, another three months. Um, However, despite all this volatility, consumers are still consuming. Uh, you know, half the consumers are purchasing the same amount of goods and services that they did in the last week. So, um, you know, again, it was a leveled, more tempered off version of spending with the consumers. But most of them say that, you know, it hasn't necessarily changed in the last week or so. But what consumers are buying really starts to unpack where the economy is heading. Food, obviously, you know, is is the number one thing that consumers are spending time on, but it's basically essentials that they're focused on. You're looking at food, cleaning supplies, personal care, um, liquor, which many consumers in 2020 do define as an essential, which is certainly understandable, um, as well as uh, packaged drinks and things of that nature. So that's really what they're buying. Really, I think the insights for the for the sentiment of the consumer comes out in terms of what they aren't buying. Uh, you know, many consumers um, say they're consuming uh, less than they did uh, since 2019. And the areas that they're consuming less in are more to discretionary purchases. One of the biggest shifts that we're clearly seeing um, happen as a result of this crisis, and it's happening in 2020, is just a massive sea change in terms of e-commerce adoption. Uh, in fact, there has been a greater increase in e-commerce penetration as a percentage of retail sales in the last eight weeks than there was in the 10 years prior. So that to me is by far from a business standpoint coming out of 2020 and all that 2020 is, uh, that's going to be coming out of this year is just, it's going to be the year that was the massive accelerant for e-commerce. And you look at categories like grocery shopping and even automotive that are seeing just a huge shift uh, to e-commerce. And um, I think that's something that's certainly going to be here to stay uh, moving forward. And that's really part and parcel with other trends we're starting to see, like curbside delivery. Uh, over 62% of consumers say that they expect the retailers that they shop at to have some sort of curbside delivery uh, moving forward. They trust the supply chain more if they can go pick it up on their own. And that's something that uh, you know they expect to continue. Um, the things that consumers are not buying on is a major purchases over half said they're not making any major purchases in the next three months so when you look at luxury items when you look at the automotive space when you look at um, expensive vacations obviously homes uh you know consumers are still really pulling back so while they may try to resume the normal life in some areas when it comes to major purchases that's one area they are certainly uh very hesitant to, to dive into um and with that we're seeing just continuing increase of mentions of consumers wanting to be more frugal during these times. In past webinars, we've talked about the DIY boom and many consumers wanting to make things on their own versus uh, buy them as a, as a, as a notion of, of being frugal. And we're clearly seeing that continue uh, right now. Another major consideration is that um, on July 31st, we are seeing the $600 federal unemployment boost end. And I think, you know, you're seeing a lot of uh, mortgage deferments being called by banks and, you know, I think that a lot of the underlying financial issues that may have been pushed off a bit due to government intervention may come the roost at that point. And we may start to see, um, you know, really the underlying impact on the economy from uh, an unemployment rate that we've never seen before. And, um, you know, I think the government right now is obviously having discussions uh, about continuing that or, or putting a new bill in place to extend that, because I don't know if most Americans are 
ready for some of these um, you know, benefits to end as soon as July 31st. Um, in terms of travel, over 50% of Americans have canceled their summer travel plans. The ones who haven't more so just had uh, more modest summer travel plans, whether it was just driving to a national park or something of that nature. Uh, but obviously, a lot of plans have been canceled, much like spring break uh, being canceled in 2020, uh, summer travel is being canceled as well. And many parents, many parents on this webinar right now are probably really struggling, myself included, um, with what to do with our kids over the summer with camps being canceled. A lot of camps are trying to go virtual. Parents are skeptical. Um, that is a big challenge for consumers right now. And I would argue a big opportunity for brands. How can you help parents keep their kids um, active? What activities can you help parents with to be creative and keep their kids active and really have your brand become a utility because this is going to be a summer unlike no other with so many summer camps being canceled and kids sitting inside um, on beautiful summer days with really nothing to do. So to kind of wrap things up, because I want to make sure we have plenty of time for my friend, Dahani Jones to join, uh, you know, no one could fully predict the kind of change that's going to occur. Um, this is an interesting quote from uh, Ron Chernow in the Wall Street Journal. But, you know, even with the advantage of hindsight right now, a lot of us are flying blind. And what we're going to try to continue to do at Suzy is really just help you guys navigate what consumers are thinking and feeling so you can try to make sense of it all. So um, I think Abel is going to pull open right now uh, some of the results that we had from the uh, from the study. Let's see if he's going to pull it open. I don't think you're there yet, Abel. Up oh, here it comes. Perfect. So uh, these are the questions that you asked us to answer. First and foremost, um, I think that that wasn't the one, Abel, which one to make you feel supported right now. I think that was the word cloud. Maybe it was. So which brands make you feel supported right now? And we had Amazon uh, being the brand along with Nike and Walmart as the brands that uh, have consumers feel most supported right now. So a lot of that target is popping up there as well. Uh, you see Ben and Jerry's there. So uh, this, again, not a surprise given, uh, you know, some of the things that we uncovered during our presentation. And the second question, do you agree with this following statement? A brand's actions are important when it comes to my purchase decision. You see here that 43% of consumers agree and 32% uh, strongly agree. So again, this is something that, and, and we'll, you know, we could share with you the breakdown. It, it does usually veer towards uh, the more younger consumer set, but all consumers really do agree uh, with that statement and uh, not a surprise given, you know, all the insights we shared uh, today. So um, I'd love to now um, welcome our special guest, Dahani Jones. Let's see if we can get Dahani to pop up here. Uh, this is a new webinar platform that we're using for the first time today called Big Marker, uh, based on the fact that many of our clients aren't able to access Zoom anymore. So let's see if we can get the honey on uh, the video up. Oh, I think we may have him. I'm on. I'm What's up, man? You made it. Thank you for joining. So good to oh, see you. Oh, man. No, I thanks, for, man. thanks for having I, me. I, I think uh, the last time I saw you, you came to the Susie office right before this was all happening. And then, boom, the world changed. So it's good to see you. Uh, fact, well, I'm, I'm glad I'm able to join. And, you know, I always love your conversation. And I, the fact, like, the, the entire presentation was phenomenal just because it gave me a lot of perspective, allowed me to kind of crystallize a lot of my own my own thoughts. And I think as a as a consumer, as a, as a parent, um, you know, that's a really great idea. If you're a brand out there that you're trying to figure out how, how to keep kids occupied. Right. right. Right now, everybody's trying to figure out, like, what do I do with my sons and what do I do with my daughters while I'm at home? I'm trying to do work. They are not necessarily in school. I don't know if I want them to actually play with some of my some of their friends. So how do I keep them occupied that if someone could solve that? Let me I know. know. Okay. <laughs> I, I'll purchase it myself. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I couldn't agree more. Thanks for joining. So I want, I have a couple questions for you and we have a ton from the audience. First and foremost, um, can you talk a little bit about Stand Together Now? It's a platform I know that you've been involved in um, and just like why you're behind it, what you guys are trying to accomplish, ways that maybe brands um, that are listening can help and be involved. Yeah. So, um, you know, obviously COVID-19 COVID happened and there were a lot of people financially affected and um, Stand Together worked alongside with Family Independence Initiative, uh, along with Stand Together, in order to create a platform called uh, Give Together Now. And Give Together Now really uh, was, uh, it's a 
a rapid response where we could give $500 ACH transfers to families that have been financially affected due to COVID-19. And there were a lot of brands that jumped in, um, a lot of people that jumped in, a lot of philanthropists that jumped in. We even had one philanthropist one philanthropist that committed $2.5 million and all they wanted to see were acts of kindness. Um, and it's really about creating a, um, a scenario where if, if you have and you can contribute, um, we can directly give in, in a philanthropic way. So we were actually able to raise a, a total of uh, $61 million, um, which has been, which has been wow. phenomenal because we've had a lot of great partners and a lot of great people that have um, supported and have been a part of our, our journey. So if brands want to be get involved, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you about um, standing if, you, if you just go to give together now, that's the best way to engage. Um, you, you know, uh, that that's the best way to do that. Gotcha. So let's talk about some of the issues that, that, you know, we addressed in terms of, you know, the racial injustices and how it's bowling over in society right now. I mean, as a, as you know, a former professional football player um, and a black entrepreneur and somebody who really, has such a wide and diverse group of friends, I mean, out there like, A, like, were you at all surprised to see this happen? And how do you think this is gonna play out moving forward, both with consumers and businesses in general? Well, I'm I'm not surprised it happened because I've, I've lived through it my entire yeah. life. You know, I can think back to, to times when I was in middle school and, and high school and racial slurs were thrown my direction. I can think about even playing football and being on the field and and fans saying certain things. I can think about being on a, on a mountain when I'm snowboarding and I'm getting, you know, racial insults being, you know, slunt, you know, thrown at me from the chairlifts. Um, I can think about boardrooms that I've been in and, um, you know, racism that, racism that has been sort of uh, applied in my direction, you know. So I've lived through it and you know, I'm 42 years old and I think that, um, right now is a really unique time in our in our life where so many things have essentially um, come to a head and, and things are at a fever pitch and so i'm i'm not surprised i'm um i'm supportive of all the advocacy i'm supportive of the things that people are doing i'm supportive of the contributions that people are making i'm supportive of the protests that that people are um peacefully engaged with i'm supportive of the words that CEOs and I'm, I'm supportive of you having this seminar right now. And you said, you know, you weren't sure if you should do it. You, right. you should do it. Right. Because the con yeah. it, it starts with the conversation, but most importantly, it comes with the action. And I think that's what's so great about your, your platform and your company is that you are able to distill these insights into a, a consumable way where, you know, whether you're in marketing or whether you're in data analytics or whether you're in sports like myself, you can take that information and now you can have a conversation with someone. And more importantly, we can now go out and do something about it. Yeah. And I mean, for me, I guess my struggle is like, I see the data points, but I have not lived in your shoes, right? So all the things that knowing how great of a person you are, just like, and knowing despite that you've gone through all these things, like how do people who aren't black that want to better understand what's happening. You can read the data, but but knowing it and understanding are two different things. What's the best way somebody like myself or maybe other people uh, that are watching and listening can truly understand yeah. what you're going yeah, think, through and ways to better, best react towards it? Yeah, I think, I think number one, it's always, I, I think it's number one, you have to look at yourself. I think you have to sort of understand your own privilege and, and where you've been and people that you've been engaged with and look back and realize some of the conversations. And you may find that you've had some even just, you may have had some moments where you weren't as good as you could have been. So I think that's always number one. I think number two, I think it's, it, I think it's always appropriate to reach out to those that are around you and facilitate discussions and i think three it's always important to go outside uh, outside your comfort zone and i know this is easier said than done because a lot of times we sit within our house in our neighborhoods and our neighborhoods may not be as diverse as the community that that we're, we're trying to understand and so sometimes you have to go down the go down the block and go around the corner and meet someone that you've never met before participate in one of the peaceful protests or maybe even maybe even stand on the side of the street and observe a lot yeah. of things come through observation and conversation 
and actually being able to, you know, to, to look inside who you are in order to figure out exactly where, where you stand. Um, one of my, one of my friends, a guy named NQ, I think you may have met him yeah, before. He's, he's a poet, right? And he talks about, um, you know, we're, we're going through it. No, we're actually, it, it, he, he says, you know, in life right now, we're going through it. The fact is we're going through you. Right. And what that means is you're going through yourself. And that's why people have such an emotional response right now is because we're actually starting to solve some of those issues with who we are as people. And um, and that's challenging. And it's and it starts to al allow different levels of emotions to start to bubble to the top. And it might incite an argument. But if you have both agreed that you have a difference and you both agree to have a conversation about it, you can work through those details in order to, what some might say, ascend the, 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 the tough climb or the mountain yeah. that we all are on now in order to defeat the systemic racism that has been in our country for 400 years. Definitely, definitely. And I, I think dialogue is so important. I think in the social media world right now, there's not enough dialogue. It's like people are just taking shots. You know, it's like you can you can post something and then somebody will take a shot and move on. And it's not healthy dialogue. It's not me and you getting on a video and discussing things. And I really think there needs to be much more of that. And I think that that hopefully th this will all facilitate much more, much more dialogue for sure. Yeah. And and I had I had a great conversation on Stand Together Live with uh, um Tyrone Woodley, who's a UFC welterweight champion. I had a great conversation um, with Damon John, who's the, the people's shark from, from Shark Tank. Right. And I've had great conversations with NQ on, on, on Stand Together Live. And everybody has a different perspective. But I would say that we all agree um, that things need to change. And we all agree um, that racism needs to end. What we all need to understand is that it takes time. And, and you know, uh, President Barack Obama did a town hall meeting a, a couple, you know, maybe like a week ago. And, and he said that, you know, while we have those that are out um, working towards change, we also need to have the follow-up, right? And so what you, what we're talking about so is like, we need the CEOs in the room. We also need the board members to be able to, to change as well. We also need the governors and, and the mayors. We need to be able to get out and vote um, in, order, in order to affect policy. Um, so there's, there's so many different pieces to the puzzle. We all have our inherent responsibilities and brands have a responsibility as well in order, because you just saw right in the data. People want to care. I always, I've always maintained people care um, people want to know more about what you, people want to know more about what you care about before they care to know you. And it's of the course. same thing with brands. People want to know what the brands care about before they care to invest in a brand because yeah. people are more woke. Right. You know, are, it's so interesting though, Zahani, because like what I've seen is like, so we raise venture capital funds for Susie and we went out to Silicon Valley and we probably pitched 80, 80 of the most prolific Silicon Valley investors and not one of them asked us how diverse our workforce was. Not one of them asked us what we were doing to drive a more diverse workforce. They only want to know about our numbers. And those same VCs now are going on Twitter saying they're, they're, they're starting they're, to they're change the they're whole thing. They, you know, yeah, yeah. VCs want to know um, what is the ha, how many female um, employees do you have? How many um, right. um, African American uh, employees do you have? Um, what does your board look like? You know, how how are how are you looking at running your business? And and that only happens when people start to have those dialogues to challenge others um, yep. about how they're running their business. You can look at Reddit, right? The CEO of Reddit stepped I should down. Should have put that in the presentation. My, yeah, that was amazing. Right. My my friend Michael Siebel jumped in, and now he's on the board, right? You can look at Tumblr. They just called a guy Caval over over yep. to yep. Tumblr. Oh, wow. right? yep. so that's another one of my my friends. And then you have uh, Paul Judge. He's the one that's on the board with um, with SoftBank and their $100 million commitment. So people are starting to wake up, right? And they're starting to realize um, that that people through technology are, are um, and transparency know what you're about. And they will follow up and they will follow through with it, right? So now more never. 
submit yeah. a check. You can't just make an ad. Now, I will say that PNG did a great ad, by the way. I don't know if anybody saw that, but um, if I invite you to, I invite you to watch it. And I think that what Nike has done with Colin Kaepernick, I mean, they supported him from the very beginning, and they still continue to su support him. So, but people will follow that. People will under People will. Um, people will look at you differently depending upon what you do right now in, in this moment. Um, and they will evaluate that for the rest of your entire life. Yeah. And I think in this moment, but then, you know, I think what I worry about is you see a lot of companies that are doing these campaigns, one cool piece of content, but it's like, wh where are we going to be a year from now? Like, are we going to go back to where we were and are, are the same, same issues going to creep back up again or which companies are really going to change from the inside out? So it doesn't creep back up. again. Well, well well, here's the thing. That last quote, we don't know. We don't know, right? The, we 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 have no we have no idea what what people or what brands will continue to operate in the same way, or they'll just go back. I will say, so like a company like AngelSoft. AngelSoft was a part of our Give Together Now, and they've done it. They've done an amazing job. Um, but people will see what you do right now, and because of the transparency, they will continue. They won't forget. They won't forget how you how you respond right now. And so yeah. I don't want those that are watching right now to be hesitant in terms of what you say. I just want you to realize that it's important to think through what you are saying. And I yeah. think it's important to have a 360 approach. The CEO has to say something. The board has to say something. The brand has to do something. The people that are working in the room have to look different. Um, those that you're reaching have to be different, right? What you contribute to has to be different. And people say, well, that's too complicated. Well, unpacking 400 years of, of racism in the world is, is complicated and it takes time. Yeah. And if you can have a meaningful conversation with those that are in your company and then be able to use businesses like yours at Suzy or be able to walk the streets and have a conversation with people, as you said at the very beginning, you know, you know, you, you said um, uh, you have to you have to speak with consumers. That you said, right? Yeah. So don't be Listen. afraid to speak to consumers. Don't be afraid um, of the emotional response that someone might have. I mean, I've had plenty of my friends reach out and ask how I'm doing, and I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and it's and sometimes that's what it just starts with. But I would say the most important thing to start with is yourself. I've had I've one friend who is extremely privileged comes from a great family and they've had to have tough conversations in their own house, right? Because us as parents, we need to have those conversations with our, our kids and recognize maybe some of the things that we haven't been able to teach them because it wasn't something that we essentially had to deal with. And so also listen to your kids, right? My son learned about black lives matter through Disney junior. So think about that, right? Yeah. Now I'm having a conversation conversation with him because of Disney Junior. So the brand has a responsibility, just like the parent has a responsibility, just like the executives have a responsibility, just like the government has a responsibility. We all have a responsibility in making change. That's not going to happen like that. It's going to take time. Yeah, I think it's interesting you talk about, like, I'm glad you brought that up, the importance of listening. One thing I haven't seen is brands just uh, on Twitter saying, you know, we like you, I'm sure, are outraged by it happening. What would you like to see us do? And branches ask consumers, their consumers, what would you like from us? Do you want us to, you know, support a fund? Do you want us to commit to hiring X amount of people of color? Like, because basically, how is one person that's sitting in an executive tower trying to have to make these decisions? We should all make it together. And I think it's a great well, point. I, I, I think it sounds like they need to be asking you that question and yeah. you need to reach yeah. out to other people. Yeah, um, and, and like I said, I said that from the very beginning, organizations like yours and look, Matt didn't ask me to say this. This is me saying this, right? Being able to talk to people and ask them. It's a simple, hey, it, it's kind of like it's kind of like walking down the street and run and, and um, walking past someone and asking them how are they doing? Right. Like those simple, simple questions can change someone's day, but also it can change your perspective. Yeah, and so it, it's always important to to be able to do that. And in maybe in, in part, you're right. People are reactionary, and they think that they have the right answer. Um, you, we don't have the right answer. Matter of fact, we don't have the answer. 
Right. It's a collective and it's answer not that be solved we have overnight to. here. Definitely. Say it again. It's not gonna be solved overnight. It's not gonna be right. solved in a week. It's not gonna be solved when the protests are over. Like I, I I forget. It doesn't even matter what the what the company was, but there was an agency reaching out on behalf of a company to um I think Chantel Martin or an, an artist basically saying, like, can you paint over our boarded up store while this is still relevant or something? And it was like a big thing, but the reality is like and it could have been poor wording, right? But the reality is, it, this isn't just a still relevant thing in a week or a month. It's not like COVID, which hopefully there's a vaccine that goes away. This is a systemic thing that's been underlying our society for centuries. And it's going to be something that's going to be going on for, for really ever. And we just have to get better every single day. So, Agreed. Yeah. Um, so what else is going on in your world? Let's switch uh, gears a little bit. Um, and then I want to see if there's any additional questions that we have from the audience. What else are you working on right now? And, and where are you working out of right now? Well, you know, we, we, I don't know. Well, I've told you we started uh, Petrum Data, which is a data analytics company. And we've uh, we, we have access to, you know, 10, 10 million homeowners. And we really look at those insights that we've been able to garner as a business in order to help people understand, you know, who's best to target at the right place at the right time. Um, and so that's what I've, I've been building here in, in, uh, in Michigan, working downtown in Detroit. Um, you know, with my co-founder, Jabril Lockhart, he came out of uh, American Express. And I've just really been curious about, you know, people. And I've been curious about these insights. And I've been curious about just like so many people on, on the call today, right, on this on this webinar, you know, so curious about what's happening in this world and how, how relevant um, and how important it is to ask those insights from the consumers so that we can better reach them at the right place at the right time. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Uh, I got a question from the audience uh, from David saying, how do brands balance asking people what they want with not wanting to ask black people to do all the heavy lifting? So, you know, how can, I guess, how is it incumbent on the organization as a whole versus having black people do the heavy lifting? That was the question that we got in. Yeah, I, I think it's, I think when it, when it comes to understanding your brand, it's, it's important you know, it's sometimes it's important to target. It's yeah. important to, to target your audience. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and to specifically ask um, people, because if if I'm if I'm wanting to affect change and I'm and I'm affected by that change, I want you to ask me so I can tell you. Now, it's yeah. also important for me to um, be sensitive enough in order to bring other people to the table so that we can collectively work on it together. But I think it definitely starts with those that are most affected in this moment in time. Yeah, I think collaboration collaboration is huge. Um, we got a question about football, and do you think it should come back in the fall? And what what, what do you think the future of the NFL is this upcoming season? Um, well, the one thing you, you mentioned before in terms of uh, with COVID, nobody thought it was going to last this long. I thought that we were going to be stayed at home until at least September. So. I'm still well within the window of, of what yeah. I thought it was going to be. Um, when it when it comes to football, um, football will come back. Um, I'm not sure it'll be the same environment that we've been used to. Um, Stephen Ross down at the Miami Dolphins, he's thinking about changes in, in his entire um, in-game experience, which would go from, let's just say, 70,000 fans in the seats all the way down to maybe 20,000 in the seats right. because of social distancing. Um, I think those that are in in suites. I, I had a I had another webinar uh, with the folks from like Ticketmaster and several other places talking about how the suites in the specific arenas they're probably those tickets are going to potentially cost a lot more because everybody's going to want to get in there. Um, yeah. So all in all, I think there's going to be football. The environment's going to be a lot different. The fan experience is going to be a lot different. I mean, if you see overseas, some people have completely canceled the entire season, and some people have have uh, relegated themselves to, you know, cardboard cutouts of people that have essentially paid $25 to sit in the seat and not be there. And on the other side, people have leveraged technology um, in order to allow the first person point of view from your home. Imagine like a Zoom call in the stadium and they just put an iPad in your seat. So there's a lot of different ways that people are thinking about it from a techn technology standpoint. But I think football will be back. It just will look a lot different. Yeah. And how do you feel about, I guess, how Roger Goodell has handled everything? Do you have an opinion on that? I don't know if it's an area you want to talk about or just it's it's obviously an more of an incendiary topic. 
Yeah, I think there are a, a lot of conversations that still have yet to happen within the National Football League. And I and, you know, I'm I'm always cautious. It's kind of like it's kind of like the, the Twitter headline you're talking about. A lot of people yeah. read these headlines and they just send it on. And I'm really happy that Twitter is starting to evaluate what that exactly. might look like. Right. And for you to actually double check that. So I'm in the state of double checking right yeah. now what's actually happening. So. Um, because I love the I love the NFL, and I know the NFL has its issues, um, and they're actively working through it. Because I know some of the people that are behind the scenes that are doing that. Yeah, yeah. Rico uh, just asked, "What you know? What do you expect the NFL owners' uh, response to be to the players and fans? Like, will there be a response? How you know we saw NASCAR ban Confederate flags? Like, I mean, they're, 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 they're late to the game there, but that's good. But Daryl Daryl Wallace Jr. You know, he's he's one of my friends. You know, they call him you know Bubba. I mean, that was, I mean, his entire car is, is, you know, painted Black Lives Matter, you know, and, and he has the hands intertwined. I mean, that's, that's where it starts. It starts at the heartland of America where, where yeah. so much change has yet to occur. I mean, don't forget, yeah. you know, like in San Francisco and New York and Chicago, Miami, and a lot of metropolitan areas, you know, we've, we've had a diversity of thought and diversity of, of mind. And, and albeit in some industries, a lot of industries or all industries, they need to change, but there's another part of America too that also is now coming to the table because of NASCAR, right? And and Bubba Wallace, you know, Bubba Wallace Jr., he's the one that's leading that. And so, you know, as I talked about before, or as a gen uh, I forgot someone asked the question, you yeah. know, you need to go sometimes direct to the source, not just in places that you're comfortable with. As I said, you need to go to the places that you've never been because that is a part of the untapped consumers or maybe your primary consumer that you've never had a conversation or exchange with. Absolutely. And you talk about sports and athletes. Like one thing that comes to my mind is that if you look at pop culture and how people spend their money and spend their time, so much of it is driven by influencers, athletes, entertainers. And I think in the back half of the year, it's really incumbent on those with a voice to speak up. So yes, it's important for brands to speak up, but if you have millions of followers and you have uh, profit it in a country based upon it being a free world and a world of acceptance. If you want that world to continue for others and even for yourself moving forward, it's really incumbent on you to speak up and do something about it. Like LeBron well, is a great example, look, you know? So athletes have been speaking up for a long time, a, yeah. a long time, you know, yeah. you can always go all the way back to the Olympics. You can, you can, you can go back. Um, you can just go back through the, you know, uh, whether we're talking about baseball, whether we're talking about, you know, boxing and Muhammad Ali. I mean, there's just so many stories of advocacy that are placed within the world of sports because we do have that platform. I mean, that was part of the reason why I love doing Stand Together Live is because I was able to bring some of those athletes and some of those other, you know, actors or business leaders to the table in order to be able to do that. A guy like Jimmy Chin, you probably, you know, Jimmy Chin, right? Yes. Free mm -hmm. Solo. He came on, he talked about advocacy, right? So you have Jimmy Chin to Tyron Woodley, you know, who, each of, between the two, they have five, reached a five million people, and now you have people like, you know, LeBron James that are leading efforts to, towards, um, you know, vote voting, right? Getting out and voting. Um, you even have uh, DJs like D Nice that are going on club quarantine. You know, he's one of the biggest advocacy uh, um, advocators who's working alongside with Michelle Obama along yeah. you know, with, with voting as well. So. We have we have gifts and we are grateful for those gifts. And now it's our time to be able to use those gifts in order to create a platform so you can reach more people so we can have these dialogues and we can change this systemic racism that's been in our country for so long. Absolutely. I just want to say it looks like we're running out of time, but like, you know, this was kind of a last second thing that you came on is just you're so very articulate and I think you explain things in a way that everybody can understand. And I just it's been great to hear from you really go deep with you in this topic. And I definitely think you have so much to offer, uh, not only to our company and others. So I just hope you have the opportunity to continue your platform because I definitely think your voice that so many people out there could desperately uh, need to hear and listen to. So I just wanted to say that. No, no, I, and I appreciate that. And if I could be a, um, a service to anybody, you know, like Matt, you, you called me, you asked me if I could come on and of course I'm going to do that. But I think, right. you know, I think it's also being, I think, I, as a, a black man, need to be available to have discussions, right, where I can talk and I can feel comfortable in an environment where we can work through some of these details. And so yeah. I appreciate the fact that you brought me on so that we can have this talk. And I'd encourage everybody that's on, on the call 
to bring other people to the table. If if you need me to come to the table, I'll come to the table. Reach out to Matt and I'll be at the table. Right because like as I said, this is a moment in time where we will truly be well, where we will truly remember the moments that really mattered. And this is a, a, a moment that we will be able to look back and say, okay, I learned possibly something from this and I did something about it, right? Obama talked about the follow-up, right? The follow-up is not just taking these notes that I'm doing in the background that, or anybody else uh, is doing in the background, but applying those notes and challenging the room that you're in. And when you look around and it, and it looks all the same, calling someone in and saying, this is, this is not right. We need to change this room. Right. Um, and, and be aware um, of our situation so that we can all make a difference. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you again for joining. It's been amazing. Uh, and obviously we'll be in touch real soon. And uh, I want to thank our audience um, uh, for listening. If you have any questions, um, you can hit us up uh at uh, well, my email address is here, mattb at suzy.com. And obviously we'll try to get everybody this video as, as soon as possible. Uh, we'll also in, in our email out to everybody as a thank you, uh, you know, make it clear that the honey is available. The honey just being yeah. available to so no, people. Just, so thank you, you, you might be a little busy. <laughs> you, wait, you can just go, it's, it's the honey at petrumdata.com. You can reach out to me that way. Perfect. As well. Perfect. Yep. And we also have your Twitter handle on the screen at the Honey Jones. You can hit him up on oh, Twitter. Oh, you got to get my but, Instagram. And, my Instagram is oh. at D0057. You know, like I'm, you know, my football number was 57. So I'm like James Bond, but 57, not seven. So D0057. But I think you wore 55 on the Eagles one year, if I'm not mistaken. I, did, I, I, I wore 55 from the University of Michigan through the Giants, Eagles. And then when I got to the Bengals, it was 57. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, Matt, you and I, we go way back. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I just remember being at the Bengal Stadium with you for that Steelers game, and it was it was an experience I'll never forget. So <laughs> way back in the day. Um, awesome. Well, great seeing you, my, my man. Uh, we'll be in touch real soon. Thank and you. Audience, thank you so much. Everyone stay safe. We'll be in touch real soon. Thanks, everyone.